And welcome, folks. Welcome to Taboo Topic. I'm your host, Ken Drew, and I am joined by a special guest of the hour, Kristen Turner, who is a pro-life activist. And we've actually had a conversation about a couple of months ago, but I kind of messed up on the recording as far as the editing process. So that's a quick backstory. The second time we've actually had a conversation. So this is a round two. Hopefully I won't mess up again, but how are you, Kristen? Great. Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to bring this message to everyone. Yeah, that's great. How uh, has been life since uh, last conversation? I mean, <laughs> the whole landscape of U.S. politics has completely changed. And especially with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, things look right. a lot different. Yeah, I agree. Um, so go ahead and explain who you are and what you do and uh, why you do it. Cool. My name is Kristen Turner. I'm the executive director of Pro-Life San Francisco. I'm also the communications director for PAL, the Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising. And I am a young pro-life activist who engages in direct action nonviolently to end abortion, as well as many other causes, because I am an atheist, a progressive, a vegan. I, I really try to lend myself to consistency within the pro-life movement and within all justice movements alike. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, so it's interesting that you say you're progressive and an atheist, and it really breaks the stigma because when it comes to pro-life as far as pro-choicers, they tend to point to, oh, it's a religious thing, or you know, if you're religious, then you have to be pro-life. You can't be a, or you're conservative, right? So you can't be a progressive or a female or even an atheist and be pro-choice. And so I'm curious to hear like what your thoughts about you know, why that is, like, why is there such a strong stigma when it comes to being pro-life and, you know, whether it's you're an atheist or you're progressive, like, why can't there be more progressives who are pro-life or atheists who are pro-life? So this one, there's actually a lot to talk about when it comes to this. First and foremost, the pro-life cause transcends any modern day United States political party. There have been people who've been pro-life for hundreds and hundreds of years because simply that they are against violence against unborn children and children in the womb. And mm -hmm. I think that it's really interesting that we have this conversation about who is pro-life because there isn't a significant gender difference between you know pro-lifers and pro-choicers. About half of all women in the US consider them, themselves pro-life. But I think a lot of it comes down to a couple of things. First and foremost, the modern day abortion industry was founded by literal Nazi eugenicist men like Lothrop Stoddard, who, yeah. who tried to get feminists on board with this message. So, for example, Bernard Nathanson, who founded NARAL, which is one of the biggest pro-choice organizations in the country, he said that they have to get the feminists on board with <laughs> abortion or it's not going to work out. And in reality, right. it's these men at the top of these corporations and these companies who want to exploit and make money off of the suffering of people who can get pregnant and their, their difficult situations. Because in reality, according to the statistics, even pro-choice statistics, most abortions happen because of poverty and financial insecurity. And so they see that and they see that as a capitalistic opportunity to benefit from the suffering of unborn children and their families. And not only that, but there are overlapping interests in people that create what I call and what many pro progressive pro-lifers call the abortion industrial complex. So there are many people who have a stake in hiding women, progressives, atheists from being the voice of the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And it's a messaging strategy. It's been pretty much their one and only messaging strategy for <laughs> right. decades as to stereotype us all, make us all look like old white conservative Catholic men and <laughs> I know some really cool old conservative Catholic men. Shout out to you, Dr. Michael New. But um, yeah, there's some like pretty cool people in the movement. And I think it also has to do with, you know, a lot of pro-lifers can tend to be really unaccepting. And as a progressive, I'm trying to get into the pro-life movement and make space for people of all persuasions, politically, socially, religiously, so that they can be a part of a greater movement for the unborn and not just harbor these beliefs themselves. Right. And it's interesting that you mentioned the situation when it comes to feminism and everything like that, because when the abortion industry first kicked off, at least in the when the Roe v. Wade was trying to be pushed through the system and everything like that, the leader of the feminist movement actually had no interest in the abortion industry as a whole in the beginning stages. And so I guess my question to you as far as why do you think they were able to convince, you know, that leader to go ahead and pursue this route? And why do you think 
they're able to come up with these slogans and why slogans like, you know, my body, my choice is such a popular, you know, effective uh, messaging campaign for the pro-choice movement. Well, I think a lot of it has to do, you know, if you look back at the history, it actually wasn't an easy decision for feminists. It nearly mm -hmm. completely tore apart the National Organization for Women about like a third or, or a half of them left during a specific meeting when they decided whether or not they would take abortion on as an issue. And right. so it really did cause this huge rift in the movement. And I think a lot of pro-choice people try to ignore that and say, well, no, if you're a feminist, you have to be pro-choice. When in reality, pro-life feminists have existed for a very long time and they still do exist. And I think that a lot of pro-choice people come from a genuine belief that abortion is necessary for them to move forward in society as an equal. Right. But the pro-life feminist philosophy says that, you know, none of us are free until all of us are free. Those are some of the basic things about liberation. Those are the basic things that people like um, that people have said over time, feminists, famous feminists have said, and it really does ring true with the pro-life cause, because what I'm saying is that my liberation can't come at the expense of another person. It can't come at the expense of a child. And abortion right. is inherently a conflict of rights situation. And I do think that, um, you know, it's difficult and I'm not saying it's easy and that, you know, women should stop complaining and like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like you just want to murder babies, keep your legs, so stuff like that. I'm saying that we need to restructure our society to support people so they don't feel pushed to have an abortion. Well, at the same time, humanizing unborn children so that people don't have a desire to turn to that when things get difficult. Yeah. And one thing that I will say that you also mentioned as far as the abor abortion industrial complex as a whole, even though like you're not we just, we've talked about this as far as like our beliefs about universal health care, you know, polar opposite ends. But the thing I will acknowledge is like I do recognize and why I understand the appeal of universal health care is because it gets treated like a business. And based right now, our healthcare system is run like a business and it shouldn't Absolutely. be run like a business. It shouldn't be a business module. It's like we're trying to heal people. We're trying to actually make sure people get better. Yeah, we're it's not an extension of that right to life. It's a reflection of our right to life. Right. And that's something you and I agree. We just have different ideas as far as like how to fix it. But I'm, but that, but with that said, like that is what's been able to drive the abortion industry because they were able to treat like a business module instead of actually looking at the problem. And it always struck to me, I don't know about you, but it always struck to me, like why, what kind of doctor Christian would tell someone in order to protect a life, you have to kill another human life. Like to me, that seems to be a violation of their Hippocratic oath, if you ask me, but yeah. I, I agree. I think that a lot of doctors, unfortunately, it, it can help them to compartmentalize what they see as doctors because obviously they see gruesome things. But mm -hmm. I think that this compartmentalization of their emotions and the fact that unborn people are human beings can be really dangerous when they take it into the territory of abortion and they use that emotional disconnect to kill people instead of healing like they vowed to do. Right. Now, with that, so you also brought up something about like the pro-life movement sometimes has a tendency to be non-acceptance. So it kind of leads into my question as far as like, what has been some of the, well, actually go ahead and give us like your personal journey as far as like, cause I know you were once upon a time, the traditional feminist pro-choice position, and then you became a you know pro-life feminist. So tell us like your actual story, like from that moment and where it clicked for you, where like, you know what, I got to support the unborn and like, the surprises you've seen in the pro-life movement since you've actually started taking action in it. Yeah, this is kind of a long story, so bear with me. But as Go I ahead. said, I started as like a feminist who believed that abortion was okay. I was very staunch about it. It was actually one of the main issues that I came into understanding when I became politically aware. Mm -hmm. um, some of the main issues I first started to learn about when I was becoming like politically aware was um, routine infant circumcision, abortion, things like that that I still talk a lot about. But um, I was pro-choice. I even did a presentation at my school where I created this whole poster <laughs> and like was talking about abortion. It was kind yeah. of cool. Um, but I was very pro-choice in high school. And really the only people who stepped up to have conversations with me were white Christian men. And of course that reflected on me as a, well, of course they're pro-life. <laughs> like they don't care about women. And they tried to explain the science to me, but I was so engulfed in like the propaganda that I had consumed online, like, for example, there was this one documentary I would watch over and over and over again. And it was about the Pink House, which is the last abortion facility in Mississippi. They just shut down. So, Alex, <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, like, it showed the inside of the facility and all these 
poor workers are going to be put out of work because these horrible anti-choice politician men who just want to control <laughs> women's bodies. And I was like so sympathetic to that because obviously I'm a woman, I'm a feminist, and I understand that women are still put through horrible things to this day because of our gender. And so I was like, yeah, this is just another thing that lines up with, you know, women being treated poorly. Mm -hmm. So I, it wasn't until later in high school that I started to reconsider my position. Um, I was being groomed and sexually abused by one of my teachers and the administration found out and he did go to jail, but I was so stressed from this whole situation, the bullying, everything that happened. I didn't really understand. I couldn't consent. And so mm -hmm. I was so stressed. I stopped having my period. That's something that happens to a lot of people when they go through that, which can make it even scarier because, you know, clearly you were raped and then you don't have your period. The first thing that goes to your head is I'm pregnant. So right. I was 16 and I just turned 17 and I was afraid that I'd become pregnant by my abuser. And right. obviously the first thing that comes to my head as a pro-choice person is abortion. Like if I am pregnant, I'm going to get an abortion. I'm too young. I don't want this baby, like all that stuff that, you know, people say. And mm -hmm. I started to do research on abortion before I'd found out if I was pregnant or not. Um, and I looked up like, what is abortion? How is an abortion done? Things like that. And I came along some resources by Live Action who made abortion procedure videos that were like an animated medical model of what right. an abortion looks like narrated by someone who's done over 10,000 abortions. So mm -hmm. um, I saw that and I just thought to myself, like, that's a literal baby. Like, this isn't a clump <laughs> of cells. This isn't right. a glob of tissue. Like, that's a baby, like full on. And so I was like, rape? is horrible. Like I hate what I'm going through right now. It's awful, but I don't think that doing this to somebody else is ever going to undo what I did or right. is, is ever going to undo what happened to me. And so like, I, I look back now, obviously I'm still healing from that. Like, I don't think it's something I'm ever going to be able to move on from, but um, my sisters went and they got me some pregnancy tests from like the dollar tree or something. And I found out I wasn't pregnant. And I was so relieved because obviously Everyone wants to prevent teen pregnancy. Everyone wants to prevent pregnancy from sexual abuse. Nobody wants that. Nobody pro-choice or pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really left me bothered that I had supported abortion. And so I became like this personally pro-life type of person where I was like, yeah, that's really horrible. I would never do it. But like, I don't know about like telling other people what they can do or whatever <laughs> common right. pro-choice slogan. Be pro-life for yourself and not for others, which makes absolutely no sense. But um, <laughs> I yeah. had started college early. I graduated high school early just because I was getting bullied so bad. So I like, I finished my senior year in a couple months and I went to college and it was there that I was in the sociology class where obviously we talked a lot about social and political issues because it's sociology. And <laughs> right. this was in the time when like the first heartbeat bills were being passed. So like everyone was pissed at pro-lifers. I cuss. Sorry. Okay. Everyone was angry at pro-lifers and they didn't like them. And they would say all these horrible things, like the stereotypes we talked about and they don't care about women if they die and all this stuff. And I was just thinking to myself, like, I mean, I'm pro-life and I'm not any of those things and I don't want women to die. And mm -hmm. it just really rubbed me the wrong way. And so one day in class, there was this kid who literally would constantly bag on pro-lifers. And I just turn around and I'm like, well, I'm pro-life and I'm a feminist. And I think that it's wrong to kill unborn human beings. Like, I don't think that that's feminist. And right. like, this is about, you know, socioeconomic struggles. It's not about like this and this and this. And everyone was just kind of like, what? Because I like, <laughs> exactly. Because it wasn't just that I said that and that I broke their mold and they didn't understand because of their confirmation bias. It was also the fact that I had like read the bill, knew all the specifics, were laying it out and like talking about it. And they were like, this girl did all this research and never said anything. So yeah. that was when I was like, that felt really good. Like I told the truth. And I, I think that they probably think of pro-lifers differently now. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so maybe I'm not just personally pro-life. Like, if I care about all these other feminist issues, if I care about like black liberation, animal liberation, if I care about the environment, if I care about all these things, then like I care about it, even if it doesn't just affect me. Like I felt like right. that was a selfish position to take. Like I can't only care about climate change when my house is on fire. I can't only care yeah. about black liberation when my black friends are being murdered. Like I have to care for everybody. And so this idea of intersectional feminism is really what brought me into being outspokenly pro-life. And I started a group at my college and I started doing tabling and talking to local pregnancy centers and meeting all these amazing people. And then 
I was working with a group that like they do great work and I'm definitely not going to be like, oh, don't work with this group. But um, yeah. I was a progressive and I felt like my identity wasn't being reflected by just th this work that I was doing. So I was like, I'm going to start my own group. And so I started a group called Take Feminism Back. And we were a registered nonprofit. We're like not active anymore because I do other stuff. But we were a registered nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. And there was probably like six of us on the team. And we would basically talk a lot about social and political issues. We would, you know, have these deep philosophical conversations with people on the internet while simultaneously making designs for pro-life feminists and like merch for pro-life feminists. And we would sell it. And then we'd use all that money to donate to pregnant and parenting people who are in difficult situations. And um, I did this for a while until um, Teresa Bukovinak, who is the founder of PAL and Pro-Life San Francisco, she found me online because I made this series called the Pro-Life Feminist Series where I drew my like fav favorite pro-life feminists and I put them on merch and I sold it for these fundraisers. <laughs> and she yeah. posted it on her account. And at the time I was like, ah! fangirling yeah. like all this stuff because you know the person you look up to someone like Teresa that made me realize I could be a feminist and be pro-life was giving you attention <laughs> exactly so I was like this is so cool like I was like thank you so much for sharing my stuff and she's like oh would you ever like go to in-person events and I was like oh I'd love to go to in-person events but I don't know anybody like super close to me that's pro-life um and she's mm -hmm. like well I live in California and I was like no way because I lived in <laughs> California and right. In retrospect, I think she kind of understood that I could be somebody who could be mentored into a powerful pro-life position. Because the first time I ever went to anything in person that was like pro-life, I went to the Women's March by myself with pro-life signs. Yeah. And looking back on that, I'm like, dang, that was some bravery that like even now I kind of don't have. But um, <laughs> it's like that obliviousness that makes you so, you know, you're so you passionate like, and you're so you have that extra about courage. It. Exactly. Cause you don't understand how like ravenous the other side could be, but they were actually pretty nice. So, mm -hmm. um, I went to this March, Teresa found me and we started, I started going to San Francisco to do events with her. And yeah. literally after just a couple events, she's like, do you want to take over pro life San Francisco? And I was like, Oh my goodness. I don't know about this. Like I don't, I haven't done activism that long in person, especially like she's asking me to organize a nationally recognized pro-life organization. And mm -hmm. she just put so much trust in me. And I kind of didn't really have to think about it a lot. I was planning on going to college. I was a music major. I studied voice and I was planning on moving to the East coast that fall to do more schooling. And she's like, drop out of college and join the pro-life <laughs> movement. And I was like, okay, so I did it. And yeah. um, I moved to San Francisco a little over a year ago. It's, I think it's been almost a year and a half. And I mm -hmm. took over Pro Life San Francisco and I've learned a lot. I've traveled the country doing nonviolent direct action, doing rescues, promoting pro life causes, speaking with people, helping pregnant and parenting families in need. Like just absolutely everything. I feel like I've seen it all. But at the same time, I feel like there's so much I haven't seen. And then I helped Teresa when she was starting PAL. Yeah. Um, I kind of came up with some of the central philosophy that we use about abortion being an anti-capitalist issue. And especially because, you know, like I said earlier, when I was a feminist, I thought, yeah, this abortion issue is about controlling women because historically we have been controlled. But then when you ask a pro-life person, why you're pro-life? Well, I'm against killing people. Well, why would anyone want to kill anyone else? <laughs> Pro-lifers sometimes will go like, oh, well, God, or oh, because evil and things like that, that people are like, okay, I'm not convinced. But if you yeah. say, well, actually, this is a continued pattern of exploitation by a capitalist society. Money can motivate people to do pretty much anything, including killing human beings for their own benefit. We've seen it over time. And I think that that message is far more compelling than a lot of the messages the pro-life movement was using. So... That's kind of how I got involved in the pro-life movement. I'm still doing right. lots of stuff, still finding my way, but that's how I got involved. And I will say that when it comes to capitalism as a whole, like I support capitalism as much as the next guy, but capitalism is a double-edged sword in the sense of free will. And when there's no moral compass that people are biting in that free will, then that leads to corruption and exploitation, as you mentioned earlier, especially in the healthcare industry. So what now you I want to get into like this biggest surprise so far since you've actually been a pro-life activist, especially when you took over pro-life San Francisco. I think you didn't mention that last time in our last conversation. So that's interesting and cool to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what's been the biggest surprises as a whole since you've been pro-life activist being pro-lifer now? I think there's a couple things. One, 
I never had a problem like jumping on a megaphone, getting rowdy, like doing these direct direct action things. But mm-hmm. I noticed that a lot of people don't want to do that. And I'm kind of like, come on, guys, let's do it. Like, I'll organize these protests and people are like shy. And I'm like, like, I'm kind of an introvert, but I don't know. There's something different. It's like this adrenaline rush when you get out there and you speak your mind and you like stick it to the man and you tell them. And I, <laughs> I feel like I've seen so many young activists. I hand them a megaphone and they're scared and they take it. And once they start yelling, they're like, whoa, I can do this. And like, they, it's totally like a flip of a switch. So that's something that's really cool. I think that I've also been surprised by, you know, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Good surprise. Um, yeah. I was definitely surprised. I feel like that there is like a progressive space in the pro-life movement. It's definitely difficult. And I'm sometimes surprised by like, Sometimes people can be really hateful, even if they are in the pro-life movement. But I, there's like a community. It's not just like a couple fringe progressive activists. Like there is a community in the pro-life movement of progressives, and a lot of them have really diverse views on different issues. And it's it's nice to be able to talk in those circles. And then I think like the biggest surprise probably would have to be just the sheer cruelty of so many people that I've seen. Like it sometimes it makes you question everything and question humanity and just the nature of who we are as human beings and as a society to see like the absolute visceral cruelty of not just abortionists, but even the people who defend them, like seeing the mangled bodies of children and then trying to show someone else that, and then them making jokes about like eating that baby or like things like that, where you're just like, I don't know how I could ever do that. Even if I was pro-choice, like I wouldn't, see that baby and be happy about it or think it was funny. And so I think that's definitely been a surprise. And also the way the media covers the abortion issue has changed my perspective completely. I used to like yeah. understand that, yeah, there's media bias because we covered media bias in that sociology course I mentioned. Like it was definitely yeah. a real and, and thing that affects us in our everyday lives. But I never got to understand it completely until I had firsthand experiences. Like <laughs> I think just two weeks ago was the first time a neutral media outlet ever called us pro-life. So that is like, yeah, like they never call us pro-life. They never even, they barely call us anti-abortion anymore. They call us anti-abortion rights. And like, like for example, when the Dobbs versus Jackson hearings were starting on the first day of oral arguments, there was like this huge coalition of pro-lifers. Like the pro-lifers outnumbered the pro choice There was like 20 to one. There were secular pro-lifers, progressives, all sorts of people. And there was a huge group of us in front of the cameras. And then when I go and look back at all the articles from that, they basically moved past the front line of people to photograph the people behind us. And it was like six people with giant signs that says you're going to hell and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, that. it does not reflect who was there at all. And yeah. so it's just, that's definitely been a surprise. Not one that I like am continually surprised by. Like it's kind so of Trump funny was when- right when. So Trump was right when he calls out fake news and everything like that. You believe that now? I don't believe what he thinks is fake news a lot of the time, but I definitely think there's a bias against pro-life people in the media. Yeah. And there's like demonstrable proof of that by mm-hmm. like, for example, Pinterest, they put pro-life search terms under their porn tags so that it would be suppressed. Yikes. And that was a huge issue because they were literally trying to pr- suppress the pro-life message and Stuff like that. But I think that a lot of times Donald Trump will say fake news because he doesn't want to be held accountable. Um, He doesn't like that people are calling him out. And so he's like, "Eh, don't believe the media because there's already this existing understanding that the media is biased and he can he can benefit off of that. Right. No, I get it. I mean, Trump has a big ego. So when someone tells you when someone the big ego tells you you're wrong, you don't want to hear it. So I get that. (laughs) And I supported Donald Trump, but that's a different story. But um, but you did mention Roe v. Wade and everything like that. And that when we had the last conversation, that was before Roe v. Wade's decision. And I was really trying to make sure like I had an episode and right as the ruling came out. But unfortunately, like I said, I was stupid. Anchor was stupid. So um, let's go ahead and talk about like our reaction to Roe v. Wade, I guess, and like how we feel about it and, you know, where you were and everything like that when yeah. it came out. I was at the Supreme Court when Roe v. Wade was overturned. Mm -hmm. And wow, that day was just life changing. So I was in D.C. that week for an activist training that I was involved in. And we were going to the Supreme Court like every morning just because, you know, we thought Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned. So (laughs) it was that morning and I really did not think that Roe was going to be overturned that day. I thought it was going to be the day after. Um, Yeah. 
because I've been like talking to some lawyers and they're like, well, I think that it's, the decision will be this day and like for this reason, blah, blah, blah. So I was right. like, oh, I won't wear my cutest outfit because it won't be overturned today. And then <laughs> like, that's yeah. so stupid, but just to kind of get in the mind of an activist sometimes. But mm -hmm. anyway, all of us woke up super early that morning for camp. I was staying in basically like a dorm of all these yeah. other activists. And we got up, we went to the Supreme Court and like we were all just protesting doing our thing like there's these cops out there that we were trying to like get out of our way because we're like we're trying to get in the cameras like get out of here we don't care <laughs> and um i think that somebody had called the police in because they knew beforehand or something because there were a lot of cops and it was really not violent or like even that many people like i've seen way more people there before and I was standing there. I had this huge megaphone that I had, like, mounted on my shoulder. And I was, like, going around, like, yelling, all this stuff. <laughs> and then I just hear Kristen Hawkins at the podium. And she goes, the decision is out. And I was, like, no way. Like, I freaked out. Yeah. And I just get on that megaphone that I had. I was, like, the decision is out. The decision is out. And it got so quiet. And then Kristen Hawkins goes, the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. And everyone just screamed their heads off. I was screaming. My friends were screaming. Like, I don't even know. It was like the happiest moment, but dread at the same time. What and then, like, as soon as I realized how happy I was, I got super defensive because I was like, dude, they're literally going to kill us. Like, these pro choicers. <laughs> but they just kind of stood there. They just yeah. kind of stood there. Like, they have it's been shock. so violent at the Supreme Court before. Like, at the draft leak, oh, my gosh. They literally, like, were beating us, like, with megaphones. They punched Randall in the face. He was bleeding. They were throwing water all over us. Like, you putting... Post? Yeah, like, there's videos of it. I have a Twitter thread of, like, pro-choice violence, but... Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really bad when the draft leak happened, but I think it got it out of their system. Because when Roe yeah. was overturned, they were just kind of like, uh... Like, some of them are crying, but they weren't even that mad. And I was like... Like, they're disappointed, like, their aggressive tactics didn't work kind of deal. Exactly. And so, we were just, like, partying. And <laughs> it was so, like, touching to see all of the older folks that were there. Because they have been fighting this issue for decades like i had yeah. so many old people that day tell me like i remember when roe v wade was put in place it was the worst thing in my life and i vowed that i wouldn't die before i see it overturned <laughs> and stuff like that and like i was there next to randall terry and Teresa bukovanak when it got overturned and randall was bawling and Teresa was bawling we we're all just mm -hmm. screaming and bawling and i remember i got a lot of hate for celebrating it like even from pro-lifers like they were like don't celebrate this it yeah. doesn't mean fetal personhood. It doesn't mean this and this and this. Like, I was but it ended the, it. It was, but it ended the state sanctioned disregard for human life. So that is worth celebrating. At a federal level, it allows us to, like, have so much more power and control over, you know, these pro-life legislation things. And so, basically, I made this <laughs> pro-life legislation thing. It's very technical term. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> It allowed us to have the power to legislate fetal personhood at a state level. And I think that that's a huge step that we haven't even had for 50 years. So I'm going to yeah. celebrate it. And I made a post the following day because there was like this photo of me that kind of blew up. Um, it was a cover of like an MSNBC article where I'm like, I got my megaphone. There's a picture of it on the wall over there. I, think I, I, actually, saw, I actually think I saw a, bit, a photo of like Ali Stuckey, whatever, that Christian conservative like posted a video of like a, or posted a photo on Instagram and like went viral. I forget what it was. But it was like and remembrance of like all the pre-born babies and you're like in DC with the candle lids and everything like that. Yes. So that was what I was about to talk about. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. The day after, because I was getting so much hate about celebrating Roe v. Wade, I made this post because like that night we went and had a vigil for the babies that were killed in DC. And mm -hmm. that's a whole nother story. But basically <laughs> I was really, really, sad about these babies and i was like i should not feel bad about celebrating and i'm not gonna feel bad and i'm gonna tell everyone why i don't feel bad so i made this post where i'm like i'm there i'm with the babies i'm really feeling sad about everything and i was like this is why i celebrated because literally yeah. these children have been mangled and killed and tortured and now we have the power to legislate that at a state level which we didn't have for 50 years i am gonna right. celebrate and i'm gonna be proud of it and like that post ended up blowing up. I got like almost 13,000 likes, which is the most likes I've ever gotten on a like Instagram <laughs> post. And I was really happy because I think that a lot of other people felt guilty for celebrating. 
And I think that my biggest message would be like, don't feel guilty for celebrating. But also, if you do feel guilty, which you probably should, um, <laughs> you should channel that into helping people, making tangible change. You should help support pregnant and parenting people. And um, that's one of the reasons I said that there was dread when Roe v. Wade was overturned, because it means that the people who actually do care, which is not a lot of people, because obviously we're not motivated by money or huge corporations, the people who actually do care have to continue to step up in ways we've never done before and support all these people that the government and society and the pro-choice movement has left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it was so odd, the feeling in the coming week of just being like, Roe was overturned, now what? Because it was pretty much all I ever thought about. It, not just the overturning of Roe v. Wade, but what I would do after Roe was overturned. And right. it almost felt like the pro-life movement was like, what do we do now? So... <laughs> um, that's where I kind of am stepping in. I think that rescue is the past, present, and future of the pro-life movement. I yeah. think that nonviolent direct action is necessary for liberating unborn people and their parents. And that's where I'm headed. That's what I'm doing. That's mm -hmm. what our next move is. I was going to say, so like, what is, what do you think like should be the next step for the pro-life movement as a whole, whether it's a conservative uh, pro-life movement, like Life Action, for example, or pro-life San Francisco, more progressive pro-life uh, organization like what do you think should be the next step for the pro-life movement as a whole well first and foremost i think we need to put rescue back at the forefront of the pro-life movement what because do you mean by that for, for conservatives like that's not going to register in our mind like what is rescue what do you mean by that so go rescue ahead rescue is when you go and you physically stop a child who is planned to die is scheduled to die that day from dying so okay. back in the 80s and 90s that was clinic blockades where people would sit in front of the doors just silently they'd either pray or you know, just hang out and <laughs> right. they would basically physically be intolerant of the act of abortion because if abortion is murder, act like it. That's mm -hmm. what we're saying. And so in the modern day, that's a federal crime. Now you can't sit in front of an abortion facility. You can't block the entrance because rescue was so effective. Mm -hmm. um, they had to make a federal law against it. So now what we do is we go inside of abortion facilities, which may sound even scarier, but it's not blocking yeah. the door. So we go inside we have roses and attached to those roses are information about where people can get real nonviolent health care for themselves and their children and basically anything they could need. And we go inside, we offer the roses to the people in the waiting room and we talk to them about, you know, why they should choose life and why we're going to be there for them and how, you know, they are equally human to their child and we are here to support them as a community. And oftentimes the police will be called on us and they'll tell us to leave and we'll say no because we are physically intolerant to abortion. They are literally killing people and we're not going to respect the property line. We're not going to respect the legal boundaries of an, of an abortion facility because the government says we should. That's an immoral law. And we not only have an obligation to not follow it, but an obligation to actively break that law. Because if we don't, then we're legitimizing the abortion industry. Mm -hmm. When we stand and we don't do anything to challenge that law, we're saying, yeah, it's okay. It's okay that it's there. <laughs> And yeah. I want to give a huge shout out to sidewalk counselors because I know that sometimes that can come off as sounding like sidewalk counselors aren't doing enough when they absolutely are some of the most important people in the movement. But, um, you know, we've been dragged off by cops and we're saying, yeah. no, I'm not leaving. And I am going to go limp because I'm in solidarity with the unborn child who can't leave, who can't stand up and walk out, who can't go to jail, who is literally stuck here and can't move and is going to die unless you stop them. And so that's what we do. We go there. Um, and I think that if we don't do that, if we don't take a stand, then we're not acting like abortion is murder. Because yeah. rescue is built upon three fundamental principles. It's built upon nonviolence. It's built upon um, identification with the child. And it's built upon physical intolerance of abortion, yeah. which pretty much not any other tactic in the pro-life movement incorporates those three principles. And I think that only through those three principles will we see unborn liberation. And so I think that we need to continue to expand our networks that support pregnant and parenting people and families and unborn children through, you know, financial help, job assistance, rent, things like that. But at the same time, the pro-life movement needs to do nonviolent direct action. The yeah. pro-life movement has more arrests for nonviolent direct action than any other movement in history. And nobody knows about it because the modern pro-life movement and what I kind of call the corporate pro-life movement, <laughs> they 
they don't want to break the law. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to lose money. And I think yeah. that that's incredibly wrong. And there would be no difference in doing that for the pro-choice side than the pro-life side. So I, I think that without rescue and incorporating that back into the pro-life movement, there isn't a path forward for us. We cannot leverage political power in both political parties, mainstream parties in the U.S., without rescue. And yeah. I, I attribute rescue to creating, a, creating abortion as a political issue that was in the mainstream in the U.S. And I think that progressive pro-lifers need to continue to rescue if we want to see any type of political power come about where we actually have candidates that we can vote for in the next four or five years. Um, so that's well, my take on what we should do next. Well, I was going to say, like, I will be the first one to admit that I did not know that fact that pro-lifers were jailed more than any other movement. Like, I didn't know that, to be honest. Yep. So that was interesting to hear. Literally. Like, uh, I, I know people who have been arrested, like, 500 times. And, haven't like, you been arrested as well? I have. I actually just, um, I think it was last month. I got out of jail. I was in jail in Virginia for a rescue that I did there. Yeah. And how many times you've been jailed, if you don't mind telling me how the kids? Um, I think think i'm it's kind of hard to keep track when you go into all these facilities <laughs> oh, so i've been arrested like a handful of times i've served a sentence once in virginia yeah um but i've been like in a jail for being arrested a, a, a small handful of times it hasn't been that much i don't have a long enough track record yet to <laughs> brag but yeah um, well at least you're someone that like backs your act backs your words up like you put where your money you put your money where your mouth is that that's the term so yeah. i respect you for that so Thank you. <laughs> so i, I think respect. that everyone should do it if abortion is murder then act like it and you know that was kind of a controversial thing back in the old days of the pro-life movement because people were like well if that's the case then we're allowed to kill abortionists because it's like defending the unborn child but i'm like no we act non-violently we cannot solve a horrible social issue by reflecting that issue through ourselves. We cannot solve violence with more violence. So, so what do you um, think there's should, that. Okay. So what do you think then as far as like, what is next on a legal aspect then for pro-life legislation? Um, how should pro abortionists be held accountable? For example, as it comes to the ones practicing the abortion, for example, um, like how do you, how would you like to see California, for example, like legislate, even though California is a super pro pro choice, not pro life pro-choice state. Um, how would you like to see California in particular like legislate pro-life at this point? First of all, they need to not prop they need to not pass proposition one. If I yeah. could give anyone any message today, it would just be vote no on prop one. So proposition <laughs> one would amend our state constitution, which would pretty much make it unchangeable that abortion should be allowed until birth electively. Currently, California, you can have an elective abortion until 24 weeks in pregnancy. And then after that, you can have an abortion for medical reasons. So like um, if their life is in danger, which, you know, I don't think pro-lifers are against having those exceptions. Every single pro-life law in the country has that exception. So um, yeah. but what they're basically saying is that they want to expand elective abortion until birth, which is absolutely horrific. And the majority of people and the majority of Californians do not support it. So that's yeah. my first step. Second of all, I think that California politicians need to shape up. I don't think that there's like a ton of California politicians, even the ones that consider themselves pro-life, who are doing a whole lot about the issue. I think that they're sitting in these seats that they've been in for a long time and they just kind of accept the fact that they're only there to kind of put a small wrench in whatever the Democrats are doing. And I think that we we need those people to be doing better. And yeah. I would ideally like to see a ban in California on abortion from the moment of fertilization. And yeah. I do believe in a restorative justice model. So I definitely would take a different path than I think a lot of pro-life people in terms of like the abortionist. But actually it's really interesting. Most pro-life people are, I would say we're on, are on board with the restorative justice model for people who seek abortion. The, yeah. like, I, I think it's a very fringe group of people who think it's okay to prosecute women it's like they call themselves abolitionists. I don't like that title, though, because all of us want to abolish abortion. But that doesn't that doesn't include imprisoning people who seek abortion. So, um, yeah, well, I, didn't, I did not know that because I consider myself an abolitionist. But I didn't realize that that's what it entailed. So mm -hmm. abolitionists, abolitionists, I would say until like two main things. I don't know if they would describe themselves this way, but like one, they want abortion fully abolished. So they oppose any type of ban that doesn't fully abolish abortion which means they would oppose like a heartbeat bill which 
Like, all of us are against heartbeat bills, but, like, we're going to go with it if it's the best we can get at the time because that's literally yeah. going to save thousands of lives. Um, right. So, so it's for sad. them, it's like an all, like, 100% either we ban it completely or no law passes. That, exactly. Is that what you're saying? Okay. And they've, like, sabotaged specific legal bans on abortion before, which is really frustrating. But it's that and then prosecuting women, which we don't agree on. So, um, yeah, I would say that the pro-life movement needs to enact federal restorative justice for... So, uh, what, for, so would you say, like, what would you recommend that as far as, like, what should we do for women who have actually stopped abortions in the past in the legal standpoint? Or should we provide some kind of, uh, I don't know, therapy group or community support for those women who've been traumatized by the abortion industry? What do you think? So I can send you some more resources on this, but just at a base level, <laughs> I think that people who um, seek abortions and commit abortions should have access to a victim witness fund where they um, they can go and talk about, you know, why abortion is wrong, why, you know, they did it, why they participated, all that stuff, grieve the loss of their child, grieve the people they killed. Um, but I, I really take issue with the idea that, like, we should just imprison all these people. And even recently, I've become not okay with the idea of just imprisoning abortionists because... Like, I've met former abortionists who are doing some of the most powerful work for the unborn. Like, I've met Kathy Altman. I've met Beverly McMillan. These people who not only did, committed abortion, but started their own abortion facilities. And yeah. the first time I met Beverly McMillan was actually at the abortion facility she opened, the Pink House, the last abortion facility in Mississippi, the one that I talked about in that documentary. And yeah. she told me, I opened this place and I'm going to shut it down. Yeah. And... It's people like that that, first of all, don't deserve to be imprisoned in cages by the government. I think that I, I, I have a huge issue with prisons. I'm still figuring out all my positions about it, but I <laughs> just take a huge issue with that. And yeah. then on top of that, like, why would we just want somebody to go rot in a cage when they could be helping literally save unborn babies? When they could be a Levitino, they could be a McMillan, they could be an Altman instead of sitting in a cage rotting basically doing nothing imprisoned for what they did and it's like i i feel that they need to do whatever is necessary to restore the communities that they hurt obviously i don't think that they can fully do that because you can't bring someone back from the dead but yeah. um and i, I get your point really of important. view i was gonna say i get your point of view and everything like that but i guess for me in particular like what do we do about the abortion doc abortion doctors who don't have any remorse or sympathy for what they've done for me, anyway, like I feel like there should be some kind of nuance to hold them accountable legally. Yeah, I agree. Um, with that said, though, like I mean, abortion has been in our culture for so long now. Like to me, it doesn't make sense to go ahead and jail women who've had an abortion, for example. Like they, again, it's been a part of our culture. It doesn't make any sense. So, like, especially for like pro-choicers who you know may change, like yourself. Like, should we go ahead and prison? Or get, I don't know. To me, it's like a slippery slope policy. It seems like if we were to go ahead and start jailing people who supported abortion at some point or had an abortion. Um, so I get your position or think that. Yeah. So, um, but with that said, Lo, I mean, we touched on a moment ago about the abortion industry and you know a lot about the abortion industry, like the dirty little secrets they have and everything like that, whether it's like having some fetal uh, tissue, like in our medicine, stuff like that. Go ahead and you have the floor to go ahead and Tell the world the taboo subjects that fitting for my show Okay. Uh, about the abortion industry. Go ahead. So when know. it comes to fetal organ harvesting, Pro-Life San Francisco is on the front lines. We just finished a week of action in San Francisco that included a lot of protesting against fetal organ harvesting. And we actually had some activists get arrested and cited. So, for example, Mason Deschamps, um, he's the pro-life Spider-Man is what people call him. He climbs <laughs> the buildings. He climbs buildings to raise money for pregnant Does he women. really? Yeah. He climbed the oh, Salesforce wow. Tower in San Francisco. He climbed the Devon Tower in Oklahoma. Like, you can look it up. But he got arrested at UCSF with our team because um, UCSF is harvesting fetal organs. They do it on children who are up to six months old. So even when they can survive outside the womb. Mm -hmm. And um, they are committing abortion procedures against these children to get their, their organs that are different from typical abortion procedures. So, for example, one of the procedures they do to get organs is uh, a 
second trimester induction abortion, which includes specific abortion medications. But unlike most second trimester abortions, it runs the risk of a live birth of 50.6% of the time. So over half the time they use this procedure, a child is born alive. But at the same time, (laughs) the same time UCSF claims they've never seen a live birth and they claim that they don't have any protocols on the book for what happens if a child is born alive during an abortion. So they're basically lying straight to our face and covering up the murder of children. Like, that is what I theorize. I can't say that it's definitive for legal reasons, but, like, you're doing a procedure with an over 50% chance of live birth and Mm -hmm. saying you've never had a live birth and also don't have protocols on the book, but you're saying that you've never seen, like, an infant die. Like, that's just not true like that that, yeah. that is a statistical anomaly and i don't believe that that's the truth and so um yeah. we're getting ready to challenge them legal here legally here really for those things yeah so pro-life san francisco has been doing public records requests to this university um for a couple of years now and we've gotten all the public records that show that they are harvesting fetal organs and even yeah. horrifically they're harvesting the genitals of fetal fetuses like they call it reproductive (laughs) justice but at the same time we're getting these sheets back that's like yeah we got a uterus today out of a little baby girl it's like what about her bodily rights what about her right to control what happens with her uterus that's just she doesn't get that (laughs) exactly and they like they try to cover it up and make it seem like oh it's just for research like they were gonna be aborted anyway we're just using these body parts blah 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 No, like this is the planned use of children. They're incentivizing it through these consent forms that they're handing to people who are pregnant. They're saying, Mm -hmm. if you have, if you go through this abortion, let us use the body parts here. You're at least getting something good out of your abortion. You're helping society, basically making them feel like, you know, they should and that it should be something they're doing. And they're basically placing advanced orders for body parts. So um, we are actually going down to San Diego later this month on September 20th through the 23rd. And we're having a big group speak at the UC Regents, which is the um, ethics board at UC, uh, for the whole UC system. Yeah. So we're going to go to the UC Regents and we're going to tell them, you know, we oppose fetal organ harvesting. It's wrong. It goes against your own ethics. And we've been doing that for a couple of years now, but we are going to do some particularly um, escalated tactics this time. <laughs> of course, nothing violent, but like we are going to escalate it. It's been a couple of years now and they're not doing anything. So we're going to go out there, we're going to be loud, and we're going to show them that we oppose fetal organ harvesting and that anybody, even if they consider themselves pro-choice, should be against this grotesque practice. And Pro-Life right. San Francisco, along with Survivors LA, which is another pro-life group, actually recently started a podcast called Harvesting Justice, which is about fetal organ harvesting. So really? What's it, it called out. again? Harvesting Justice. It's okay. on our website and it's on our YouTube. Okay. I, I I respect your plugins and everything like that for Thank your you. fellow <laughs> pro life. Uh, I gotta get got the get gotta get those plugs and everything like that. So yes. um I guess are you willing to talk about right now as far as like what escalate tactics or is that like a surprise? Well, partially it's not completely planned out. Second of oh. all, we can't <laughs> say it because we don't want people to like stop us. But True. um like UCSF is afraid of our social power, the social power we have. Because I actually just, right before I was filming this episode, I went down to my lawyer's office and dropped off some paperwork because UCSF actually filed a restraining order against me and a couple other activists. (laughs) They claim that we threatened to kill them, which is completely false. And we videoed the entire interaction. And I literally, so basically we were doing a rescue at UCSF where they kill these children and harvest their organs. We Mm -hmm. got in there. We, I walked, when I got in the door, I walked straight up to the abortionist because I knew her, I had done research and I said, good morning, Eleanor. And I gave her a rose. (laughs) And so then she makes this restraining order saying I was threatening her. And I'm like, that is literally the least threatening thing ever. Like I gave you a rose and I told you good morning. (laughs) And you're so freaked out by that. And what you're doing being exposed to the public that she put a restraining order. I'm no longer allowed to own firearms. I'm no longer allowed to go within 200 yards of the university, which is actually kind of close to my house. So like, it's kind of a pain in the butt. And yeah. so I wanted to show them that just because they give me this restraining order, it's not going to stop activists from coming because that was their goal. They wanted us to be quiet and they wanted us to stop protesting. And so they put this order in place and little did they know that a couple, like last week, two weeks ago, there was going to be a huge group that comes to campus and they are going to protest and they're still going to be raising noise and (laughs) making noise about this issue. And so then of course Mason got arrested. I think we had five people who were cited for trespassing, but 
yeah. it's not going to mean anything because they were protesting legally. And that's kind of where we are with that. I mean, I was just thinking in my head, I don't know if you've, you watched SpongeBob by any chance or did uh, you watch SpongeBob? Yes. Okay. Do you remember the episode where he's trying to be the hall monitor? Like very yeah. early episodes, everything like that. And Patrick's hall like, the monitor. medicine. And Patrick's like, he's looking at me menacingly. Like, that's what I just thought about your story about the rose and everything. Then it's like, oh, he threatened. She threatened me. That's what I kind of Literally. thought. Literally. Yeah. There's this girl that I actually know from Animal Rights Circles, and she pretty much did the same thing, but with Jeff Bezos. She gave him a rose. And now he oh, has a really? restraining order. Yeah, she has a restraining order. He has a restraining order against her now. And I'm like, says something yeah, like they she actually met jeff bezos and everything she actually gave him a rose yep. oh that's so funny oh my gosh i would have seen this i would love to see it in his face to be honest <laughs> yeah anyways uh but let's also talk about like the history of the abortion industry because there's some dirty little secrets that the pro-choice activists they don't talk about for example planned parenthood was once considered the negro project um which again one of those things where it's like one of those hidden secrets in the abortion industry but you've been an activist and been in, been in the game for a while, you probably know a lot more details than I would. So if you wouldn't mind telling our audience about the abortion history, the abortion industry, is like as a historical standpoint anyway, like how it started with Margaret Sanger, like with eugenicists and everything like that, and how it got led to today. You touched a little bit on, you know, the modern aspect of the abortion industry, but I want to focus more on the historical, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, of course. And just FYI, my phone is running low on batteries, so... I okay. think maybe doing like an hour or a little over that would be good in terms of time. Um, I don't want to die on you, but I will cover the history of the abortion industry. So abortion as a practice has existed for pretty much all of time. And it, it exists across species, not just in the human species, which is really sad and disturbing. And I think that, um, you know, the industrialization of abortion and the creating of an industry around it is sad because oftentimes or pretty much most cases in human history when abortion happens, it's because of something horrific or something that's pressuring someone into having it, something like that along those lines. And so the abortion industry was started by wealthy white men who, you know, wanted to use this practice in order to make money and in order to manipulate the population and eugenics. I Now people are mostly against eugenics, but actually a long time ago and not even that long ago, actually, Eugenics was considered a progressive issue. It was considered to be a progressive ideology. And that is terrifying to me. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, these people who consider themselves progressives because they believed in eugenics, they had all these other beliefs, they wanted to better the human race by getting rid of dysgenic groups, which is what they call people that, you know, they think aren't good for reproducing when in reality, that means people who are poor, people with disabilities, people of color. And right the abortion industry latched onto that and they said, you know, we can control the population through birth control and abortion, which I don't right. think there's anything inherently wrong with birth control, but I think that using it as a tool of eugenics is absolutely horrible. And so that was part of the main things that started the abortion industry. That was one of the main ideologies that helped start the abortion industry. And along with that, it was, you know, wanting to make a profit and it was just blatant racism because, right. Instead of supporting people in, you know, lower socioeconomic classes or people of color who have been redlined and have been put to socio have been put at a disadvantage because of the way our society has treated them, they instead yeah. of helping them get out of those situations with their power, they decided, well, we can just get rid of them. And it's mm -hmm. still happening to this day. And so people like Lothrop Stoddard, people like Margaret Sanger, people like Bernard Nathanson even. They yeah. they wanted the abortion industry to be used as a tool of eugenics. And so they really pushed these ideas. They, you know, I would highly recommend listening to Trinae McGee. She's a representative from Connecticut, and she's a black pro-life woman who really speaks out about what happens when it comes to eugenics and abortion and how abortion is racist. And also Sherilyn Holloway from Pro Black Pro Life. She talks a lot about the racist history of the abortion industry. And I highly recommend people to go look at their work. They are amazing people who don't get enough attention in our movement. And I want to give them a huge shout out and lift their voices up. And the abortion industry is still thriving off of eugenics. And they're still thriving off of ableism and off of classism. And I think people think that eugenics is something of the past. But even until 2017, the University of California, Berkeley had an active eugenics fund with 
tens of thousands of dollars going every year to family planning. This is right. not something that is decades and decades and decades old. This is a modern day issue. And so right. it wasn't until, you know, administrators who were people of color spoke out about this and said, this is wrong. This is eugenics. This is like not something we should be funding. It wasn't until then that it, something actually changed. And um, the abortion industry is still capitalizing off that, even in the state of California, because they pretend to care about people in poverty. But I live in one of the most impoverished communities in San Francisco. And I talk to the people on my street and in my community every day. I literally try and help them in any way I can. But as somebody who's also low income, it's not I shouldn't feel guilty about not being able to help each of these individuals when that's they're put in that position because of our society. And so I, I am absolutely heartbroken at the fact that our government, instead of wanting to help these people when they have the means to help these people, unlike the individuals in my community, many of whom can't help the other people in their community, yeah. they have the means to help them and refuse to, and instead give them abortion and say, just have an abortion. It'll, it'll help pull you out of poverty, blah, blah, blah. It'll totally help right. you all this stuff. It's just a lot. It doesn't pull them out of poverty. It just adds trauma and compounds that trauma that keeps many people in poverty for even longer because they have this emotional weight that they can't seek therapy because they don't have the money to and the resources to. And it just creates a snowball effect. And it, it's really, it's really sad that it's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's not a coincidence that a lot of Planned Parenthood facilities happen to be in low impoverished areas where the population just happens to be minorities, people of color, whether it's black, Hispanic, it just so happened, you know, that's not a coincidence by any means. Um, now, with that said, looks like we're going to have to do a part two because I have some other questions, but I will respect cool. your time and your no situation problem. with the ba ba phone battery. Um, but I want to get, I was, next time you come on, I want to get into like the foster care and adoption care system because that's also, I love to, yeah. That is something that also needs to be addressed in the pro life movement that I think a lot of pro lifers don't really talk about about these days. And yeah, I would like us to actually, and I'd like to talk more about it. And, you probably know a lot more than I would. So, uh, with, <laughs> yeah. so, I, so I appreciate you um, coming on the show. Is there, uh, go ahead and give us your plugins real quick again so cool. people can remember. So I'm Kristen. Um, you can follow me at Kristen Turner Life or on Twitter, it's Kristen for Life because um, it was too long. And then <laughs> um, the organizations I run, so Pro Life San Francisco is at Pro Life SF on every platform YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. And also go follow Pau, P-A-A-U. It's Pau now on pretty yeah. much everything. And make sure you go look at Trine McGee and Sherilyn Holloway's content. Really highly recommend. And I think that's everything. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on today's show, folks. Don't forget to hit the like button by any chance. For, before I forget, can't talk all of a sudden. Uh, hit smash the, that like button. Yes, smash the like button. Smash the subscribe share, button. Share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, even though I know none of us do, but please do it for my own ego. But I do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> do it for I'll my own ego. Bell. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, with that said, folks, uh, thanks again for coming on, and until next time, God bless.